Hi everybody, I'm recording this about two hours before the news is gonna go live, and so I am very excited for you to learn in just a little while that Nano Tyrannus is real. And it's real for good this time. I've been working on the Dueling Dinosaurs since about the time that we started this YouTube channel, so this is a really special moment for me. Now, of course, I've got a lot to say about Nano Tyrannus, but I wanted to make a video now because I wanted to just make sure that before everything gets disseminated and there's a game of telephone and nobody really knows what's in the paper anymore, I just kind of wanted to lay out uh, very quickly the pieces of evidence that we use to bring Nano Tyrannus back. I'm working on a long form YouTube video, about an hour long, full of really, really beautiful 3D animations, showing all of the evidence that we used as part of the Dueling Dinosaurs project. But, you know, times are really busy right now. Releasing a paper like this uh, is a huge task, and I've been doing interviews with CNN, Associated Press, Reuters, New York Times, you name it. And so that video is a little ways away. As both a publishing paleontologist and a science communicator, I thought that it was my responsibility to put out something right now to outline what we did in this paper and why Nano Tyrannus is back to being a valid species. I also really apologize for the ring light glare in my glasses. There's nothing I can do about it. I've tried everything. I, I hate it too. Just bear with me. If you're unfamiliar with the debate over Nano Tyrannus, the very short version of it is that there are a few fossils of relatively small Tyrannosaur specimens from the Hell Creek Formation in Western North America, which comes from the latest part of the Cretaceous period. Now, originally, the interpretation was that these fossils came from adult Tyrannosaurs that were about half the size of T. rex when they died. And so that would make them pretty much by default a new species. And because of their small size, they were named Nano Tyrannus lancensis. Nano Tyrannus meaning the tiny tyrant, lancensis named after the lance formation, which is a rock layer that's equivalent to the Hell Creek. We don't need to get into all of that now. But from 1999 on, an increasing number of scientists have come to an opposite conclusion and said that these animals are small because they are not adults, they're juveniles, and they proposed that they were juveniles of Tyrannosaurus rex. But this has been really controversial because the magnitude of change required during growth to turn these Nano Tyrannus fossils into T. rex just seemed to be implausibly high to a lot of paleontologists. But as time went on, more and more paleontologists accepted that Nano Tyrannus was not a real species, it was just the juvenile form of T. rex. And this was based largely on the fact that we had never found a fully mature animal that was clearly Nano Tyrannus. It looked like all of them were juveniles, and they were juveniles that lived at the same time as T. rex, and in the same place as T. rex, and we had never really found a T. rex juvenile of the same size. And so it seemed like this and so it seemed like the simplest answer was just that these small juveniles that lived near T-Rex and were the size of the missing T-Rex juveniles were probably the missing T-Rex juveniles. And as this became consensus, Nano Tyrannus became uh, kind of a joke in the paleontological community. There, there's a degree to which I've seen Nano Tyrannus used as a way to tell like in-group from out-group who's a serious scientist and who's a frivolous person who wants there to be more dinosaur species. I've even heard people compare believing in Nano Tyrannus to like believing in Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. There's a lot of internet memes that you can dig up on paleo meme pages of people just making fun of the very idea of Nano Tyrannus existing. But even though this became the consensus within the field, the Nano Tyrannus debate remained really, really hot. Like, this is a thing that people got into legit arguments about at conferences and in the scientific literature and in online discussion groups. It was kind of a really nasty topic and a lot of people wanted to avoid it altogether. And so I think a lot of us were also pretty happy that it just looked like the debate was ending and everybody was agreeing that they were T-Rex juveniles. But as everybody agreed that Nano Tyrannus was uh, but as everybody agreed that Nano Tyrannus was a juvenile T. rex, it also started influencing the science that we did on T. rex, and people started using those specimens increasingly frequently as examples of juvenile T. rexes for studies on like how T. rex grew, or how T. rex's ecological niche may have changed as it grew, or how T. rex's biomechanics changed as it grew. Was it able to run faster when it was younger? Was it able to bite as hard? Could it have crushed bone? All of these things were questions we were asking about T. rex, and we were asking them using these specimens that some people still thought were Nano Tyrannus. But in 2006, another specimen was discovered, and this one promised to be the be-all end-all for the Nano Tyrannus debate. And that is the dueling dinosaurs specimen that we just published the first paper on today. 
The specimen spent a long time uh, on the auction block and actually in a warehouse as there was a legal battle over who owned it and had the right to sell it. But as the legal battle resolved, but as all of the, but as the legal battle resolved, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences made a deal with the owners of the dueling dinosaur specimen to purchase them for an undisclosed amount. And that deal means that the dueling dinosaur specimens will spend basically the rest of time in a museum collection in North Carolina. And because they're in a museum collection, scientists are able to finally study them, and the public is able to go see them. They are in an open prep lab. This is a lab that you can actually walk into as a visitor to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and you can talk to the preparators who are currently freeing the dueling dinosaurs specimens from the rock. The purchase of the dueling dinosaurs for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences was spearheaded by my postdoctoral advisor and close colleague, Dr. Lindsay Zano. She and I are the authors of this paper, and as we started work on the specimen, we really tried our best to forget about all of the rumors that have swirled for decades since the dueling dinosaurs were discovered about what they might mean for the Nanotyrannus debate. A lot of people were very certain that they would prove that Nanotyrannus was right, but we needed to actually have data to show that. We weren't gonna just follow gut instinct for this. We had to test the hypothesis that Nanotyrannus was a juvenile T-Rex in every way that we could. The first of these is that the traits that differentiate Nanotyrannus from T-Rex are the kinds of traits that just change as tyrannosaurs grow. This argument basically comes from a 1999 paper by Thomas Carr, who was the first person to formally propose that Nanotyrannus was T-Rex. And he said that effectively, all of the things that look unique about Nanotyrannus are just baby tyrannosaur traits and that there's therefore not really any reason to think that it was a different species. It was probably a baby of something we already knew about. Our own study heavily, heavily disagrees with that interpretation. And there are two main reasons why. First, other tyrannosaurs don't actually show the kinds of trait changes that you would need to see for Nanotyrannus to become a T-Rex when it was fully mature. Nanotyrannus has traits like an extra sinus in its quadratic jugal bone, way more teeth than T-Rex. It's even missing a feature called a subnarial foramen, which is seen in like pretty much every dinosaur, or at least every theropod dinosaur. It's a major passageway that nerves and blood vessels use to get from inside the head to the skin at the tip of the nose. And Nanotyrannus is one of the very few theropods that seems to not have this feature. None of these changes are seen in other tyrannosaurs. Carr actually said that tooth count did change as tyrannosaurs grew, but based on more recent discoveries of juvenile tyrannosaurs and just an ever-growing data set, we now know that that's not true either. Tyrannosaurs weren't losing teeth as they grew. The number of teeth in the jaws is a little bit variable, but that difference is not happening as the animal grows. It's just a difference between individuals, and it seems that it's true for their entire lives. The other thing here is that I did a lot of my PhD research on the kinds of changes that crocodilians experience as they grow. And crocodilians are the best living analog we have for meat-eating dinosaurs like T-Rex because they still have teeth and very robust skulls and are close relatives of dinosaurs. Birds are closer relatives, but their skulls are so weird that they're not really a good model for the kind of information that we need here. In crocodile development, we found that traits like these sinuses and tooth count and extra blood vessels are things that absolutely never change as an animal grows, and they don't vary within species very much at all. You might see some variation occasionally with these traits, but overall, they're very reliable and they're very consistent, so they allow confident species identification even in babies that are tiny. I'm talking like hatchlings with skulls this big. You can identify them already based on these traits, but not other traits that do change during growth, like the overall size of the skull or the proportions of different bones or the development of ornamental features like ornamental crests and ridges. Those things do develop as an animal grows, but the more fundamental aspects of the anatomy, like where the blood vessels in the head go, are established really early on. They actually establish in embryology before the bones themselves even develop. So these are things that go way far back in their development. And in fact, based on what we know about development right now, we actually say in the paper that it's probably developmentally impossible for those traits to ever change as an animal is growing. And so this is effectively strike one for the Nanotyrannus is T-Rex hypothesis. There's just no way for a Nanotyrannus to have grown up into a T-Rex. It's not what we see other Tyrannosaurs doing, and it's not what we see modern animals doing, and it's probably not possible for any animal to do this during its growth. Second, despite spending literally years studying these specimens, we were not able to identify any single trait that united Nanotyrannus and T-Rex to the exclusion of every other Tyrannosaur. Nanotyrannus and T-Rex don't share anything that's unique with each other. 
every trait that they have in common is also seen in pretty much every other tyrannosaur. And so that means there's not really any evidence to say that they're the same species at all. Even if Nanotyrannus could have grown up to look like a T-Rex, there's no reason to think that it would because they don't share any traits that tell us that they're the same species. This is like, this is a pretty fundamental thing. If you're identifying a fossil and saying it belongs to a species, you have to show that it has the distinctive traits of that species. If you can't find any distinctive traits, you need to just settle on the conclusion that you can't identify that fossil right now. So for Nanotyrannus to not have any of the traits that are unique to T-Rex and help us recognize T-Rex fossils, it's basically a preliminary disqualification of the idea that they're the same species. There's just simply no scientific evidence to say that they are the same thing. But I know what you might be thinking. You might say, aha, but how do you know that the dueling dinosaurs is Nanotyrannus at all? Well, we were able to find unique traits that it shared with the holotype specimen of Nanotyrannus. And so we did have evidence that the Cleveland skull, the holotype of Nanotyrannus, was the same species as the dueling dinosaurs. But we did not have any evidence that either of those was T. rex. So that's strike two. And strike three? The dueling dinosaurs Nanotyrannus was an adult. It was not a juvenile when it died. It's the first adult Nanotyrannus fossil that's ever been discovered. We took a thin section of one of the thigh bones of the dueling dinosaurs, and when we looked at it under a microscope, we saw that it had enough growth cycles that we were able to calculate that it was about 20 or 22 years old when it died. And so this is about 10 years older than the uh, more famous specimen Jane that's been the focus of the debate for a long time. Jane was about 13 or 14 when she died for sure. We're not just saying that the dueling dinosaurs was an adult because it was over 20 when it died. We say this because when you look at the thin section of the bone under a microscope and you move toward the bone surface, you see the growth lines become very, very closely packed together. This is something called an external fundamental system. And that is the gold standard evidence that we use to determine that a dinosaur was fully mature when it died. No other Nanotyrannus specimen has ever shown an external fundamental system before. We do think, and so it does seem that they're all, and so it does seem that all of those are juveniles, but the dueling dinosaurs was an adult. And so in total, we have a bunch of impossible growth-related changes that mean that Nanotyrannus could not have grown up to be T-Rex, a complete absence of any traits that tell us that Nanotyrannus is T-Rex, and evidence from the growth record that this particular Nanotyrannus was done growing, and therefore that it obviously couldn't have grown up to be a T-Rex because it wasn't gonna grow anymore even if it lived another 20 years. So, Nanotyrannus is back. But there's one more wrinkle in the story. Remember the specimen Jane I mentioned before? Jane turned out to be slightly larger than the dueling dinosaurs Nanotyrannus, while being quite a bit younger. And when we looked more closely at Jane, we found a lot of ways that it differed from the dueling dinosaurs and from the type specimen of Nanotyrannus. It was missing a sinus in its palatine bone, it doesn't have spaces for air sacs in its tail vertebrae, it has this weird extra prong on the postorbital bone that probably strengthened its articulation with other skull bones. A lot of differences. Not differences that we can really attribute to individual variation. They're pretty significant differences. And so, we came to the conclusion that Jane was something nobody had expected before. Jane's a second species of Nanotyrannus. Because Jane was the specimen that most paleontologists had argued about for the decades of the Nanotyrannus debate, we wanted to give Jane a name that was like symbolically related to the fact that she had to shed all of this baggage from her prior incarnation and be reborn with a new understanding. And so we wound up naming the new Nanotyrannus species after the river Lethe in Greco-Roman mythology. In the depiction in the Aeneid, the Lethe is a river where souls have to drink so that they can forget their prior lives and be reincarnated. And so in this paper, we don't just resurrect Nanotyrannus, we also name its second species, Nanotyrannus Lethaeus. And so you might be saying now like, okay, James, cool, thank you very much, why does this matter? It, it matters because all of our research on tyrannosaurs for the last like 30 years has been based on the idea that Nanotyrannus is a juvenile T-Rex. There are a lot of ideas that have circulated a lot that are probably just entirely wrong, not because the scientists were doing anything wrong while they were coming up with these ideas and concepts, but because the identification of the specimen was incorrect, and that was biasing the way we were thinking about the fossil record. You know, for one, there are probably many more tyrannosaur species that are currently mistaken for growth stages. And we think that it's very important that paleontologists start reanalyzing this record and looking for any more cases like Nanotyrannus that we may not be recognizing right now. More importantly, 
this work really disproves an idea that's become very popular recently, that the end of the Cretaceous in North America was missing any medium-sized predators. The idea goes that there's this gap in the predator size distribution because you've got very small things like, you know, dog or wolf sized predators, and then nothing between them and T. rex adults in size. So the idea has become, well, maybe these, and so the idea has become, maybe these predators are missing because juvenile T. rexes were those medium sized predators. And that's kind of spiraled into this idea that juvenile dinosaurs were moving through different ecological niches as they grew, and that affected the way that different dinosaur species evolved and diversified. That that might have actually prevented medium sized dinosaur species from evolving in ecosystems with these really large animals that could occupy multiple niches as they grew. Now, if this idea were true, it would be fascinating and really impactful. It would mean that the world in the age of dinosaurs played by very different rules than it does today. And that's the kind of thing we do want to learn about when it's true from the fossil record. And there are cases like that. This doesn't seem to be one. Based on the results of our work, Nanotyrannus is a valid species, which means that Nanotyrannus is the media... Based on our work, Nanotyrannus is real, and that means that Nanotyrannus is the missing medium-sized predator in the end of the Cretaceous in North America. It was a really, really cool idea. A lot of people have talked about it. A lot of people got excited about it. Unfortunately, it just doesn't look like it's true. Oh, and one last thing. Tyrannosaur growth has also affected the way we study Tyrannosaur evolution, right? Because the traits that we use for our phylogenetic analyses are usually traits that we do not think are likely to be changing a lot as the animals grow. And so for this project, we had to build an entirely new uh, data set to study Tyrannosaur evolution from the ground up. And when we did that, we found something really interesting. First, a lot of Tyrannosaur species moved around to new positions that they haven't been found in before. Second, we found out that Nanotyrannus is actually a lot more primitive than most people have been thinking about recently. Even Nanotyrannus believers recently have thought that it was either going to be a close relative of Gorgosaurus or a close relative of animals like Alliaramus and Chinchousaurus. This is based on them all having these kind of long, low, sleek snouts and being generally lightly built. Our results show that Nanotyrannus was actually much more primitive than this. It's not even a member of the group Tyrannosauridae, which is really, really fascinating. All North American Tyrannosaurs that we know of that are very well represented are Tyrannosaurids. Uh, Nanotyrannus is the first Tyrannosaur to not be a member of the family Tyrannosauridae from Western North America. And that means we're going to learn a lot more about Tyrannosaur evolution from continuing to study it. Watch this space, there's going to be more papers soon. And there's one more really interesting idea that came from one of our analyses. One tree, so one version of our analyses, not all of them, and I don't want to make it sound like this result is more confident than it is, indicated that Nanotyrannus may have been descended from a group of tyrannosaurs that are known from the eastern half of North America, not western North America. The fossil record from the east coast is really poor. There's not a lot of places we can look for fossils, and so we don't know about a lot of the animals that lived here. But in one of our analyses, we do get Nanotyrannus as being nested within a group of eastern tyrannosaurs. And that means that Nanotyrannus might have appeared in North America at the end of the Cretaceous period because it had migrated in from eastern North America as the western interior seaway started to recede. Again, we need way more fossil material from eastern tyrannosaurs to be able to test that hypothesis well. I'm going to urge both other scientists and science communicators to be responsible with this. We don't know this yet. It's possible, but it's not certain. We need more data to tell. We're going to continue testing the hypothesis as best we can. We'll have to see what future studies tell us. If you like Nanotyrannus and want to learn more about it, there are two things you can do. One, go read the paper that we just published. I'll have the link in the description. And two, if you haven't already, subscribe to the Skeleton Crew. We're going to release a much longer, much more detailed video about the entire Nano Tyrannus debate as soon as I am finished with all of the complex 3D animations. It's going to be worth the wait, so subscribe so that you don't miss the notification when we finally release the authoritative video on Nano Tyrannus and how we now know that it was not a juvenile T-Rex. And finally, I just want to thank this pa and finally, I just want to thank the patrons of the Skeleton Crew for their ceaseless support. I have been working on this project since about the time we released our first video, and so this is a really special moment for me. I hope it has been worthwhile. All those videos where I allude to being tired or stressed or exhausted or busy from travel or up to things that I can't talk about right now, it's pretty much all about this, and I'm really, really happy that the veil is now down. And so thank you for your continual support, for watching our videos, engaging with them, supporting us on Patreon if you do that. You're all wonderful. So thank you, Skeleton Crewmates. We will see you soon when we start returning to our regularly scheduled videos.
All the best, Jimbo.